Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient's live talk series. Uh, and today we'll be speaking with Mark and Brenda Roberts about their journey, their journey following Mark's uh, diagnosis of early onset vascular dementia uh, at the age of uh, 62. Uh, and Mark is also the founding member and board of director of the nonprofit organization, um, the National Council of Dementia Mind, short for NCDM, and Brenda uh, is the National Council of Dementia Mind Executive Director. So thank you two uh, so much for, for joining us. I'm excited. You bet. To Perfect. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, so Mark, let, let's start off, you know, with, you know, your journey um, with dementia and, and in terms of, you know, like to start off, always start off the interview uh, and ask, you know, what, what were the early signs and symptoms of dementia that you started noticing? Well, I, I, uh, I used to know what everything was going on with a campus and uh, was involved in a lot of different things as a mechanical uh, individual uh, for repairs and stuff. And I had my certain section, but I branched out in with electrical and uh, other things. But um, I uh, I didn't hear correct. I felt I didn't hear correctly because they kept coming back. If I was in a meeting and we had a discussion in there, um, I would come out and uh, say, well, I think I should go do this. And they're saying, no, we talked about that you were going to go and, and investigate this or talk to this person and uh, start uh, start looking at the repairs and costs and stuff. And it just, I was like, man, I don't know. I, I would get the job done, but I was able to, I, my job was to, multitask too. And I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't remember phone numbers. Um, and it's not a big campus. It's, you know, it's a small campus, but uh, everything up here, I didn't have to go to a file or to a computer. I had it all on my, you know, memory. And that was just falling apart for me. Um, I, and then I would say, well, we got to remember to go do this. And they said, well, we just talked about that. And that's what we're going to go do. And it really flew me for a loop. Um, and then uh, the reaction later on was some of the employees just pushed me, push my buttons for anger. And I couldn't control my anger. Not that I I showed anger, but I didn't um, at work, but I at home I showed anger or worse yet because I was upset with the way I was being treated at work. And it was all the time I thought it wasn't my fault, it, it, but it was. Um, yeah, it, at, that, at that time it was hard. Mark would call me throughout the day from work and it was it was always it seemed from an outsider's perspective that it was always interpersonal conflicts i couldn't figure out why 20 25 years of work with these same people that now he couldn't get along with them and sometimes i'd get a call and they're like oh they're gonna call, they're calling me in the office they're gonna fire me and it was you know i just couldn't figure out why he couldn't get along with people at work and so after the fact we learned when he had his neurocognitive testing that, you know, he didn't always catch all of the spoken words. You know, I mean, we tend to talk too fast and right. miss, you know, take time to process. And so that contributed plus the memory in terms of in a meeting, say, let's go do this. Right. And they'd go that way, Mark would go this way. And of course he thought he was going the right way. He couldn't understand why they were doing something the opposite. Right. And so because you weren't getting information straight, what did I do? Who pooed it? No, no, no. What did I do? Her hearing. Oh, yeah. She'd had my, asked me to go get my hearing checked twice. Uh, but they said it was perfect. You know, there's no, no problem with your hearing. So 
course, that really bothered me too. Uh, but I didn't, I had no idea there was something wrong with my brain. Right. And um, so it, it become a lot of things, you know, to come home and do, uh, to talk with uh, family members or whatever, I'd get it all messed up. And no, they didn't say that. And no, they're not upset with you. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, anything with communication, I could not do anymore, period. Right. But um, I don't, I think the same thing when I was trying to put something together or repair something, uh, I just kept making mistakes all the time that I oh, I should have brought this with me or whatever. And that, that wasn't me. If I walked into a job, I had everything with me. And more. Yeah. <laughs> and more than, well, I'll give a good example if I can, Nicholas, because, you know, I, I didn't see this and I think other people may not see this as a, I mean, I did not see what I'm going to describe as a, a symptom of dementia. Um, from an outsider looking at my husband, he was becoming like this really angry, not nice person to be around. He's always frustrated, always to the boiling point. But an example would be, and now I can imagine what it was like for him, but being a skilled tradesman, like in the corner of a, a door, you know, you have to cut on an angle, right? <coughs> to make it set. For the and, trim. And, yeah, for the trim. So one day we're trying to cut a trim angle. Measures it, cuts it, puts it up, Blankety blank, blank, blank. <laughs> you know, it's not right. I measured that. Do it again. Not right. And, you know, who thinks when your husband's not measuring and sawing right? Ah, he has dementia. Never crossed my mind. You know, so he'd get frustrated, get in the truck, go to the hardware, buy a new piece, come home, do the same thing. And I'm thinking it's just because he's so upset, so angry. If you just calm down, you know, you'd be able to think straight and stuff. So, we're totally at odds, right? We right. didn't see it. Right. And I mean, the other part is also because, you know, Mark was eventually diagnosed with early onset, right? So Mark was quite young. And I mean, um, Oops. And dementia. Oh, Nicholas, for some reason, we can barely hear you. Oh, can you can you hear me now? Oh, that's better. Yep. Yes. You're better. Uh, I was just saying, uh, because um, Mark is, uh, was diagnosed with early onset vascular dementia, right? So yes. at a young age, that's not really something that would even come to mind, right? In terms of right. kind of symptoms, like dementia wouldn't come to mind in the first place, right? Um, right. Right. And so, yeah. we, 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 we bought into the whole stereotype. It's an old person's disease, you know, so it didn't even cross our minds. Right. It didn't cross our minds. I worked in the aging field for over 40 years. And Mark came home on two occasions and asked me what it was like to live with, you know, what were the early signs of Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, oh, you don't have Alzheimer's, <laughs> you know, because right. I, I didn't see mismeasuring and sign as a symptom. And, and so one of the things, Nicholas, that many people have heard us speak before is, you know, when you ask somebody, what do you think of when you say Alzheimer's or dementia? The first thing that many or most people say is memory loss. And I'm like, yep, we got that one down. You know, the Alzheimer's Association has the list of 10 symptoms, top 10 symptoms. I'm like, okay, we got memory down as a society. Let's move that to number 10 and move something up else up so that we can start become more familiar with that. So, you know, the, now that you look back, of course, you can see much better. Right, right. And um, Brenda and Mark, we were just talking about this uh, before this interview is that, you know, um, you know, those early symptoms of dementia also put a lot of strain on the relationship between the two of you and um, right. for a while, the two of you were separated. Um, can you tell, can you share with us about, you know, um, you know, that process and the challenges between, you know, navigating that relationship between the two of you. Right. Do you want to talk well, about first? Yeah. Um, I was putting uh, new bifold uh, doors on a closet. And um, I, uh, I could not line that thing up or measure it into, into place at all. And I kept 
fiddly fumbling around trying to get things hooked up and then bounce so I could walk it up and and place stuff in in the slots that it's supposed to go in. Well, I the short story is I got really frustrated with it because I tried and I tried and I tried and I still couldn't get it corrected. And um, so I went to ask Brenda for some help. Of course, she's working and, you know, at her office in our home. And she took time to break away and come and try to hold it. And the whole time that we were trying to work together, um, it's all I can say there was another voice answering her or was giving me instructions or what I should do. And I kept saying, no, I don't want it that way. I want to I want it to be up like this and for me to put it put it together and back and forth. And I really got very upset. I mean, I was uh, uh, at, a, at a point that I was ready to pop. I mean, I, and I'm with, I'm a big man. I weighed 280 pounds. I, you know, people just didn't mess with me uh, because of my size and my height and stuff. And I scared the living heck out of Brenda. So I'll let her take it from there. <laughs> yeah, scared the living heck is an understatement. So he's so frustrated with not being able to put the door together that and i'm trying to help him and so this was such a great example of you know we hear about the person with dementia has one may have one reality and we may have another reality because his reality and putting this door up was so much different than my reality to the point that he got so frustrated because of that and all the things that had been happening to this point that he he said i'll i'll put an end to this and he went to get a gun and so I didn't know if he meant he was going to put an end to me <laughs> or an end to him. Uh, so, of course, I, I immediately, it's the dead of winter, of course, in Michigan. And I grab my purse and I leave. So that's when we separated. And so at that point, and we like to share that story because we don't believe we're the only families that are in this kind of situation and that it's not talked about. I mean, statistically, I believe that a person with young onset dementia will lose their job and their relationship prior to getting a diagnosis. And Mark was on the way to both of those. Right. He was off work for the second time without pay. And then um, I had left the house. And so you can't, can you imagine? I mean, just think about this. Just imagine this. This is a really stressful, stressful, stressful time. And um, so long and short of it is I moved in with my daughter. And then we had been getting counseling and, you know, had no idea, none, zero, zilch, none, that this was dementia, nothing, even though I had worked in the field, had no idea. And so I got, fortunately, we have in our community, he is a neuro, or excuse me, a geriatric psychiatrist, and he had a neuropsychologist and social worker on staff. And I thought that whatever was happening with Mark was a mental health issue. And so I thought, oh, perfect. We'll start with the social worker and they'll move us up to that psychiatrist fast, yeah, or on the fast lane. And um, so that's what happened. Right. And then, um, so Mark did great. He was willing to, because he does love me, he was willing to work on the relationship during that time, you know, in terms of, then we got real intensive counseling, but then he started the medical reviews to find out. And so when the, you know, the neural cognitive testing and the communication with the psychologist as they gave us the results, was the first time it crossed my mind that we're talking about dementia. Mm. And then um, it was that and the MRI, and of course the, the symptoms that ended up with the, giving us the vascular dementia diagnosis. Right. And so, you know, we really, really worked on it. We were really huge proponents of getting an early diagnosis and getting help early because our our relationship was fractured you know 
we've been married 46 years. And, and so I say to people who, you know, if you're going to have years and years and years of being a care partner, and if you're building that on a cracked foundation, I know I'm married to a man who has been in skilled trades, right? Yeah. And what happens when you build a house on a cracked foundation? It falls down. And it falls down. And so we had an opportunity because we had an early diagnosis to repair the foundation so that then maybe together as a couple, we can weather this, the rest of this journey. And then we also, Mark never returned to work. And so once we got the diagnosis, thank goodness that we were not fired by then because it gave us access to short-term disability, long-term disability. And then we were able to have COBRA, which allowed us to buy health insurance because, you know, people who are a little older and get dementia don't realize that if you're not 65, you know, if you're applying for social security disability, I believe it's a six month wait for your disability. Even after you get your disability, then you have two year wait to get Medicare. So had we not had that disability insurance and access to COBRA, we would have been in big trouble, especially right. relationship to the healthcare when we were needing tests and counseling and other things too. So we are so grateful that we had this, this, you know, that we got the help when we did, or it would have been financially devastating and we would have been broken up as a couple. Right. And, and Mark, what was, you know, your initial reaction to diagnosis? Was there some relief to it? <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a moment of, uh, an enlightening opening or uh, meeting, uh, the counselor said, well, how do you want to tell your family? And I said, well, you know, let's whatever. I need to sit down with them. And so she suggested uh, because of uh, having the dementia that she'd be the coach and have everybody come in. Uh, Brenda was already uh knew about it, but not my children and son-in-law. And uh, so we all sat down. And when she told me that I had dementia, um, I, I just sunk in my chair. I was just flabbergasted. But I also was very, very happy. Somebody has found out what's wrong with me because I knew I was a crazy fool. And I, I didn't know how to control it, but finding out what it was, um, I knew how to, to mend those fences and work on it. And it wasn't an easy road trying to put things back together um, because you still have dementia and things happen. But uh, I was able to apologize. I was able to uh, if Brenda would say, wait a minute, Mark, you need, need to take a break. I, then I knew I was in the wrong. And so, uh, I, you know, I've been a very in, independent person and I had to give up all that independence and I had to, to allow my family, especially Brenda to tell me, no, you need to rephrase that or, you know, you need to go and, and take a break. And um, so it's a learning process for the couple and it's still stressful, very stressful. But, um, you know, I vowed that I was gonna get through this one way or another and I was not gonna end up losing my wife and my family. And that's very important to me. And uh, it, it has worked out uh, real well and with the help of, of uh, being on Zoom with other people uh, and seeing their diagnosis and what they went through also helped me to reinforce myself to be more patient, uh, to think what they said. And if I didn't understand, is ask them to repeat it. Well, and if I can, Nicholas, because when Mark and I speak at conferences and stuff back in the day when we could go and do live, um, lots of times after we share our story about the anger and that, oh, it's amazing how many people are in line 
to talk to me afterwards because they're dealing with that with their, especially, you know, I think it's, I can only imagine that it's different for a woman when a bigger man expresses that big anger versus a, a smaller woman with a big man, you know, so they're in line, they want to talk about it. And then people always want to know, well, so is he still angry? Is he still in Getting the dementia diagnosis then helped us learn to say, okay, so, you know, what did we do? You know, he didn't go back to work, so we didn't have that stress. You know, so we did a lot of stuff to relieve stress. Right. And then when he did get angry, we've spent a lot of time as a family even. Okay, so what led up to that anger? What was it that was happening? What could we do differently to help the next time? And we'd wait till he wasn't mad anymore. We would come back and we would say, explain what happened from our perspective. And, and we asked him when it happens again, do you want us to do this, that or the other thing? You know, so we were very open. So we relieved the stress. We got the counseling. When there was anger outbursts, we looked at um, what may have precipitated it. And then Mark also really got busy with trying to manage it with doing things like what do you do, like your music? Yeah, music, uh, reading my Bible. Um, and I uh, I quit doing all the stressful things of keeping up a home. I just, you know, um, yeah, I still mow lawn, but not off and on because uh, my daughter and her husband and two boys uh, pitch in and stuff and I have learned that I've got to back off and a lot of times I found myself accusing them that they lost something in you know some of my tools or whatever and then we'd find out later well hell I moved it and so um, it was just one of those things that I had to allow them to make boo-boos and not get upset about it. And yes, the, you know, we found the stuff later or whatever, but I mean, well, another, it's just one of those things that I was re very particular about taking care of my things and knowing where everything was at and things were hung in this right place and everything. But when I'd come back in, it was hanging someplace else or setting somewhere. And that was very frustrating for well, me. Well, tell them about how it is, because a lot of people don't realize, too, it can be hanging there, right? Yep. It can be right Where, in the spot where you left it, right? Yep. And I can't see it. It's just really amazing. And for an example is uh, I had set down a key on the table that I had put a yellow thing on it to identify it uh for a key for the barn and i was going to give it to my son-in-law well when i went to go give it to him i couldn't find it and i went here i went there i checked my pockets i went out in the truck i went out in the barn um and i was probably the third time going back into the house and brenda says well what's this laying on the table well i didn't even see it and it was laying right there all that time on the table with a yellow tag around it. And, um, and that's just, not a unique situation. I mean, no, that, it, that's a regular occurrence. Right. If he can't find something. And so understanding that, you know, so helping that manage that anger too, kind of recognizing um, the disability maybe is, you know, okay, the other day he couldn't find the garbage, the bag of garbage bags or the box. And um, so he went and got our daughter rather than spend time getting frustrated. He went and said, I can't find the garbage bags. And she walks out and she says, you mean these ones right here? And she had them, you know, and, and then Mark, another important thing for managing your anger was sleep, right? Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And every, all the people that I work with on Zoom with dementia all take rest, you know, rest in the afternoon. Might be a short nap. Might be a two hour nap. Might be a timeout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that, it, that 
that was important. And then I, I if I can build on what Mark said about <coughs> um, not doing the responsibilities around the house, we created an environment, I think, that Mark can do what he wants to, when he wants to, but he doesn't have the pressure to have to. So Mark's perfectly capable of mowing the lawn, physically, you know, everything. But some days you're just not up to it, right? Right. And so he doesn't have to mow. But if it's a good day and he feels like mowing, he can mow. And then that's great. And the same thing, you know, Michigan winters. He doesn't have to move snow. The boys will go out and move the snow. But if he's up early and he wants to move snow and it's a good day, he can go out and move snow. So we've taken that pressure of I have to and made it into a I can when I want to right. Right, sort of thing. So it's all about, you know, balance, balancing, you know, work and um, and really finding solutions uh, and, and problem solving right around right. the different symptoms that arises with dementia, right? Right. Yeah, I love one story, if I can tell, that we did right. There's lots of things we do wrong. We usually find out by doing boo-boos, but we had a job under the house that needed to be done, a repair job. And Mark couldn't get under the house to do it. And the boys, when I say boys, they're young men and our, our adult son-in-law, they didn't really know how to do the job the way he'd like it done. So. They went in the crawl in the crawl space area, and Mark and our daughter Tracy were in the outside. In the basement. And Tracy would, Mark would tell Tracy what needed to be done, and and, and he doesn't always get his his information straight. Straight, and so she would listen to what, and make sure she under he understood what he was saying, and then she would tell the boys what to do, and then if the boys had a question, they would tell her. And then she would take the time to make sure he understood what the question was and he would answer that. And so it was like having a translator right. and the boys did a great job yeah. doing the work. Mark was happy with the quality of the work right. and he was and, and happy. He didn't have to crawl in cross space, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> and Mark, you should tell us about your, uh, your service dog as well. Sophie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I've always had a dog and, um, ever since I was even a little kid. And um, uh, I always had a good relationship with the dogs. I trained them and everything. And it was something that I loved to do. And so I told Brenda, I said, you know, I would really like to have a dog. She had her dogs, but uh, I said, I think I should get a dog. I think that could really calm me down and something that I could, you know, hold and, you know, I could still train a dog. And so uh, I, uh, we went and purchased a dog and um, a, puppy. Brenda, a puppy. And Brenda had, um, had met this woman who's a, a dog trainer. And um, so we built through that time for the first year, we build a relationship with her. We now, you know, I, I don't have the anxiety like I used to have. She goes everywhere I go. She sleeps with me. If I have to take a nap, she comes in and sleeps with me. Uh, it, it's real comforting me, to me to have her. And, um, I, I think there's been a big, big change ever since uh, I've had the dog. Um, and I've been with her since she was six weeks old. Actually, we was... picked her out when she was two days old. <laughs> and we went and visited her as a puppy every other day. Mm -hmm. So she would get Mark's scent. scent. And... and then when we brought her home, so we did the training with the training, the trainer come to the house. But right. So she's a great companion. And so that helps with the anger too, you know, to have that. But um, what does she do you, do for you every night? Every night at 8.30, Alexa goes off and um, tells her to go get it. And she runs into the bathroom, open. Brenda has a towel hanging on the cupboard. She opens that up, grabs a satchel, brings it to me, which has the insulin and the needles. And I give myself a shot and I say, away. And then she 
takes it from me and away she goes and puts it away and comes back. The only thing she hasn't done is shut the door. So <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't doesn't close the door, no, right. right? Yeah. So, but um, well, the it's other... just made a real happy thing for me to be with her mm -hmm. like that. And plus, I was always forgetting to take that shot. So right. And our friends said, "Oh, it was easier to train the dog to get Mark's medicine than Brenda." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the dog's really been a nice addition. Uh, oh to the yeah. to, to family, life saver. for sure well yeah. and, and nicholas the other thing is on the cell phone sophie the dog wears the gps and so mark's still a driver but the gps on sophie will tell me where he is at different times and so if he has a doctor's appointment it'll pop up sophie's at the doctor's i know he made his appointment he remembered sophie's at mcdonald's okay you know so it kind of makes i know that he's making his appointments, keeping his, or, or do I need to follow him? So, so each of it gives him more independence because he doesn't have to rely on me to go get his medicine and, and that sort of thing, right? Right. right. And yep. yeah, I want to talk uh, now more about uh, the National Council uh, of Dementia Minds that you're both part of. And yeah, Brenda and Mark, can you tell us, you know, what inspired the founding of uh, National Council of Dementia Minds and um, what does the, the nonprofit do? Yeah, um, so the National Council of Dementia Minds been about two and a half years. We started as a group of friends, okay? And the, the group of friends, actually, we were doing a conference. We were going to speak at a conference here in Michigan, statewide dementia conference um, put on by the Michigan Assisted Living Association, uh, who's, who's my employer. And so they were sponsoring this conference. So I, I put out on Facebook, does anybody want to do a presentation? And they all came together and on Zoom, they're from all over the country. And it was it was fun. We were complete strangers, you know, and we came together and we created a presentation. And it was actually a program, the one we did then to give credit to the organization that helped us. It's called To Whom I May Concern was our original presentation. And um, it was like blew people away. The presentation was so great. The group got back together. They're like, can we? continue to do this for five years, Brenda, will you continue? We'll do a training every year. You videotape us that people can see us change. We can see it. Yes, yes, yes. So long story short, it started to grow in popularity. We've gone from one group to three groups. We have more speaking requests. I don't want to say than we can manage because we still want them to come in, but speaking requests. And Nicholas, we were doing this as a group of friends no Facebook page, no website, just a group of friends. And as that friendship group, we did training for over educational events for over 3000 people in four countries, just as a group of friends. And so finally we got together and we said, you know what? We've got a secret sauce and we don't need to keep it a secret anymore. And so we decided to form a not-for-profit organization and so our mission is to develop uh, a core, meaning a core, an army of dementia advocates using the Dementia Minds program. And it's really, you know, sometime, it, you know, for those interested, as, as a very, as time has gone on, it's, it's very um, beneficial to the persons living with dementia. It's very beneficial to the people who come into the educational events. And it's very educational for the people who are, um, like myself facilitating those discussions. So we do discussions for weeks on end, and then we create presentations together. And the facilitators in the group, we use their exact words. We listen, we've recorded the videos, we write a script for them. Sometimes some people write it themselves. Then we give it back and we go back and forth, back and forth until we get it to say what they want it to say. And then we put it together all in one piece, and then they do these various presentations. Mm. And um, so we do healthcare providers. Our favorite group are medical students, right? Right. Get the word out to yeah. medical students. And um, so the Dementia Minds group just started in terms of a nonprofit. We just started. Uh, we had our launch in July of 2021. So we're a brand new organization. And Brenda, Brenda mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned that 
you know, it's very beneficial for the person living with dementia as well, right? So, so Mark, how, uh, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on that in terms of how, how do you think it's, um, you know, helped you? Well, I, uh, way it's helped me is I, that's a release, you know, when uh, I can help somebody else. And if they say, well, this has happened to me or what, what should I have done with, uh, when this happened? And, um, sometimes I don't have the answer. One of the other people might have the answer, but, um, it's more beneficial, uh, to the individual the and for the uh, person who is caring for the individual that has dementia. And I, I think it's a, a segment, it, it's been talked about, but it's never been put down on paper and asked for questions and answers afterwards. And that's where I think we've really gained the ground is that um, they, the people that I've talked to, or even students, they find more comfort now and have been given information like, how do you know, you know, if a person acts like this, what is, what do you think? And I said, what, you know, you have to ask them. You have to approach them and ask them. And just because I'm not afraid to go to the counter and tell the cashier, oh, I, I, I can't think how to give you the change and then let them sort it through. I tell them I have dementia. Could you get, you know, take the change and I got the dollars. And so it's, well, it's I'm, I'm just to be in real open about dementia, what everything happens to you and things are different for me. It's different for the other people that I work with in the dementia uh, alliance. And um, it is just more comforting too for the spouses or the caretakers. They can, we give them a lot of information. <laughs> yes. I mean, a ton of information. Well, you know, this is how you should approach them. This is what you should have done. And uh, to t for an example, we just always say it's a suggestion and it's an example. Try it. If it works, you got it. If it doesn't, We'll try to think of something else. And a lot of it is the approach from other people. Um, and it makes it much more easier for us to communicate with those individuals. Right. And and Brenda, Brenda mentioned that, you know, you also, um, the organization also does presentations to medical students, right? And I'm yes. sure um, it's very powerful um, for the medical students to hear, uh, you know, a presentation directly from a person living with dementia, right? The first half right. perspective of what it's yeah. like, right? Yeah. We, ha we had fun with the medical students. We had all the people living with dementia and then a bunch of our friends come into the classroom because it was all on Zoom. And we did an introduction and we had the students guess who had dementia and who didn't. Because what, what do we hear? You know, mm -hmm. look like- Like you got dementia. Right, and so we, we're able to have the conversation with the students. What does it look like? Right. But so I think that's the piece I kind of want to reinforce what Mark started his, his last question answer is he helps other people. My husband's always been a man of service. You know, you hear about the five love languages, his love language is acts of service. And so it's important for him in terms of finding meaning and purpose or feeling meaning and purpose is to help other people. And so when he goes out to the presentations, I think what he was saying was that he feels really good about helping other people understand what's happening with themselves right. or their loved ones. And they can ask somebody, you know, that has dementia, a uh, lot of questions. And I'm more than happy to answer those, even if it's, no, I can't eat, hardly put my underwear on in the morning. You know, I mean, I'm not afraid to tell them. In fact, when I was told that I had dementia, the next Sunday I went to church, I went and I says, hey, I figured out what's wrong with me now and I've got dementia. Well, before the next Sunday, I found out that there's about five other people in our small church that have dementia. 
but it's all, you know, be quiet, don't say anything. And the wives are about, their hair sticks straight up. You know, we just don't know what to do. And so Brenda is organized in our church. Um, we did a, a, a lot of presentations there for some of the folks. Now, not everybody wants to blab like I do that I have dementia, but uh, it gave a lot of comfort to many of them that were in that situation. And in time, they have responded to Brenda a lot. And I have built some friendships there at church, serious ones, uh, with these people who have it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I enjoy doing it. I, I really care for them. It's not an easy thing to, to live with. And you're going to die with it. You know, that's all that, that there's no... No hoping you get a car crash or anything. It's this is this is your plan now is to live your life the best because we can't guarantee how long you're going to live, and you could end up in a nursing home or whatever, you know. But for me, it gives me a, a something to live for because before I could do a lot of different things. Now fishing is a real difficulty. I do not hunt anymore. Um, so, uh, there's a, and I don't garden anymore. I mean, there's a lot of things that I cut out of my, my lifestyle, uh, to bring myself to this situation that I'm living in with to, to live happily with my wife and children. Mm, right. And trying to find, you know, trying to find what, um, you know, purpose, right. Even though you there are things that you lose in your life. There are other right. things that you can gain as well, right? Like right. being able to connect with others with dementia, which is so important, right? Just you bet. It's an important reminder that they're not alone, and um, just listening to each other can make such a big difference, right? I think. Right. right. And I think you know other organizations like cancer or leukemia or whatever they've done the same thing. They have created. Uh, uh, different groups that work with children and work with adults. Uh, Cancer is the same way. And trying to bring some comfort to somebody to, to be able to look at that I can still survive and I can still enjoy life if I, I have to work at it. Yes. But um, I, uh, it's easy for me to apologize now that I have more so than I ever have, you know. So um, I, I really enjoy all the things that I have, have learned and the people I've worked with. And uh, it's really important to me for my survival skills. Right. And I, I think the last topic here that I want to touch upon is, you know, the, the myths and the stigma associated with dementia. I, I was wondering, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, what are some of the common stigmas that people have about dementia and whether, you know, the two of you have personally experienced some of those stigmas? Right. Well, one thing is, is that Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's. And mine is vascular dementia. It has different traits than any other of the other uh, dementias. There's people who... Um, who have uh, Parkinson's disease, but they also have dementia. And Lewy body is, but that right now, in my mind, that's one of the ones I would never want to have. And that's a lot of hallucinations, uh, can't sleep. They only get maybe two hours sleep a day or more, but it's very little. And um, it, it's not an easy life. It's, it's, not easy at all, but I the ones that I have worked with and visited with, uh, they're comfortable to talk about it, and it makes it easy for them to survive with that. What about this, like stigma, like that you are old, that it's all yeah, old people, old. yeah, and um, how about the stigma, which I think our group really busts our National Council of Dementia Minds, 
is that people living with dementia can't learn new things. Right. You've yeah. learned a lot of new things. Yes, absolutely. You know? So that's a stigma. Um, and then I, one of the, you know, just quick little examples about stigma was I can remember the day, you know, day one before Mark was diagnosed, Mark was Mark. The day after he got his diagnosis, he was still Mark, but people like the day before he could go out and drive and nobody questioned it. Right. The day he got his diagnosis, I remember our neighbor saying, oh, but he's out driving. You know, I mean, so we go from, you know, we automatically go to end stage, you know, end state of living with dementia. We don't see enough marks in Brian's and in and, and um, Mike's and Bonnie's, yeah, who are living well with dementia, making the best life that they possibly can. So we buy into that tragedy narrative and just shoot right there. And we fell into that. Yeah. We totally fell into that after the diagnosis. Yeah. And we we changed, um, you know, we, we made a decision that we're not going to buy into the tragedy narrative. We're going to change. We're going to um, surround ourselves with like-minded people. Right. Right. Yeah. And and go ahead, some Mark. Of these, some of these people, too, are... Uh, we had uh, one that lives alone and she lives in washington uh, dc and you wonder how she gets around she can't she, she has to put things in a certain place in her kitchen in her house and in her bathroom because she don't remember where she put it she knows where the corner is where her shampoo is but if she don't put it back in the right spot then she don't know if she's got the shampoo in her hand. Uh, but what was fascinating with her is uh, when she goes out for a walk, she takes she steps out on the sidewalk, takes a picture of what's in front of her, and turns around, and takes a picture of what's in back of her. And she does that every block. And that's the only way she can find her way back home is by going back through the pictures to find herself back home. And so I think that uh don't take the intelligence away from us we're pretty darn smart on how to survive and that's what it is it's survival to the fittest and uh anything you think of is a good idea we never shun to somebody that says they did this or whatever yeah we'll chuckle about it but we're not going to force them that helps that person but it might not help me right yeah this this reminds me of um of a recent interview that I did with three ladies from um, from the UK and they told me, you know, and one of the things was like, they said, you know, I'm not a different person, you know, I, I, I right. have dementia, but I'm still the same person. It's just that, you know, sometimes my mind doesn't work as well it, as it used to be, but I'm still the same person. I'm still a mother, a wife, and uh, or, or a grandmother, right? I'm still the right. same person. So. Um, and, you know, another advice they had actually for healthcare providers is to, and I've heard this a couple of times now, is to see the person, but not, not just the dementia, but see the person, right? And, and so right. I, think, I think that's very important. Um, yep. and, yeah. You bet. And I, I'm really, really interested in before I can't do anymore, is working with students that are in the medical field going into the medical field to help them understand because uh, our family doctor, uh, he poo-pooed the whole thing, you know, uh, you know, there ain't no way. And it, it's uh, a lot, of, it's not just my doctor, it's a lot of doctors. I know they're very, very busy. They have, you know, s schedules that are back to back, but you have, they're going to have to learn to take the time especially for dementia, but I'm sure for many other things that we get misdiagnosed over all, a lot. And I'm one of the fortunate ones that had a, a wife that is very intelligent and been in the business for all these years and was able to target the right people that I could talk to. And, and then we get an answer. Only after I got to the point that I even recognized anything. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think my last question here is, um, you know, I, I think 
um, you know, right after the diagnosis, it, it can be very hard, especially with early onset, to come to terms with it. And, you know, the two of you mentioned that as well, right? It's, it's hard to right. come to terms with it. So I, I was wondering, you know, to, to close up our interview, do you have any advice um, for someone who's, you know, on, you know, on that path in terms of just getting a diagnosis and, you know, uh, well, time? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, connecting with other people, with our relatives, um, Brenda has uh, uh, a sister and two brothers connecting with them and her father. Uh, but like connecting with our group of people that you mentioned. Yeah, and uh, not not being afraid to get on the internet and, and uh, to see if there's somebody that has the same diagnosis as dementia and I'd really advise that and to get on and talk with some of these people. Um, I know when Brenda first started doing that, it, it everything was tragic, you know, the end of it. But that's not true at all. And it needs to be broke down to pieces uh, in your story that you did really good for 10 years or five years or 20 years. You know, I was told that you could live to, you know, 20 years like this and still be able to drive and do other things. So I'm not giving up on that. I'm, you know, I want to do that. And, um, but I know my limitations too. And I, I be real careful. I'm careful about what I do, but we need to not hide this anymore. There's a millions of people who have dementia we have no idea what the numbers are because we're misdiagnosing the people and we're not keeping track of it and um, and any of the clinics now that are working on helping people with dementia will say the same thing we just don't know what the numbers are and people are losing their jobs they're losing their family and their home um, and now you got somebody that maybe uh, living on the street and uh, and is very confused. And so it's, I have a lot of sympathy for anybody that gets sick or have any kind of illness. There's, uh, you have to find uh, a very caring person and you have to find somebody that's gonna have the time to sit and listen with you. And, uh, I, I think that's one of the answers that you need to know, especially those with dementia. Start out looking and talking with people. And uh, I didn't know uh, how to operate some of this stuff with the internet. I only use a computer for work. And so I, Brenda has helped me get through a lot of that. My daughters have helped me and my grandchildren have. And uh, they're very patient with me. And I'm very careful about uh, not interrupting something that they want to do and uh, not help me, you know. So you, you just have to piddle along and, and hope for the best. But I do, I bend my knees. I, I pray a lot. Um, and it's, that's one of the things that relieves some of the pressure from me. I can unload uh, that pressure and um, feel comfortable that, you know, that I'm okay. And I, I would say, based on my experience with the Dementia Minds groups, um, it seems, now it's not everybody's story, but it seems that after a diagnosis, you know, we've talked a lot about the black hole after the diagnosis. I mean, it's shocking, it's not expected. You know, your, your whole life plan is altered and so I remember, you know, at that time, people saying, you know, don't worry about the future. I was worried about the future. Don't worry about the future. I wish they would have just let me worry about what I needed to worry about for a while. <laughs> you know, just like, just reassure you're okay. Yep, that's okay. Um, so that black hole, just acknowledging that there's a dark time afterwards, mm -hmm. and there is right afterwards. Um, I think what we found most helpful in people with our group is then when we connect with people who are living with dementia and like our friend that mark described who lives in washington and she's like i call her the queen of um 
compensatory strategies <laughs> because she's always figuring out new ways to remain independent. And so when you connect with people like that and you see how great different people are doing, you're like, I can do that too. I can be that way. And so you start to make your way out of the black hole. And then you start, at least in our groups, start great. helping other people and start feeling good and contributing to society again. So I guess if you're in the black hole, it's okay. This too shall pass, right? And then connect with others. Right. And then if you can help other people in whatever way that's good for you is a good thing for it for you as a whole. Mm -hmm. That would be what I'd have to say. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think that's a great note to end on. And thank you both so much for sharing your personal journey uh, with dementia. I appreciate it. Glad to do You're so. Welcome. Thank you. Right. Anytime. <laughs> All right. so, yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.